How's it going everyone? I hope you're all doing good. Welcome to another study session in which we are going to be learning about the joints of the human skeleton. Now, as I've mentioned before, we are doing this in an effort to understand movement and how all of these bones of the skeleton articulate with each other. We covered the anatomical planes in the previous study session as well, so if you haven't watched that one yet, I recommend you do so. Anyways, let's get on with this. So to begin, firstly, I should probably define what a joint is, right? Well, put simply, a joint is an area where two bones or more meet. The human skeleton is held together by these joints and these joints can be divided into three main types based on the materials that connect the bones. These are fibrous joints, cartilage joints and synovial joints. And we are going to look at each of these with some examples. So starting with fibrous joints, these are fixed joints where bones are connected by a layer of fibrous tissue. It's as if the bones are glued together and a, a, a typical example of this is the joints in the skull. Now I covered the anatomy of the skull a while back and we know that the skull is made up of individual bones. Well the joints between these bones are called sutures and this is a, a type of fibrous joint. You can see how I'm making note of this in my sketchbook. These may also be referred to as immovable joints and another example of this is what is referred to as the interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna in the arm. I won't illustrate this but I'll put an image up on screen. Next we have cartilage joints. Now as the name suggests this means that bones are literally connected by cartilage. An example of this and one we are familiar with would be the intervertebral discs in the spine. Remember when we covered the anatomy of the spine and mentioned that because there are many discs that exist in the spine it allows it to move a lot but individually these don't move much at all. Another example would be the costal cartilage of the rib cage that attaches the ribs to the sternum. I think I mentioned in an earlier video that this is able to move a little, which is necessary for the respiratory movement, the contraction and expansion of the lungs. So as you can see, I'm making note of all of this in my sketchbook, labelling these diagrams. So now it's time to look at synovial joints and these are the ones that will be of the most interest here and is probably what we'll spend the most time on in this video because these are the most common type of joint found in the body. Now there are five types of synovial joints that come in different forms and they all have their own names and we'll cover each of them in a moment but before I do I just want to mention that there are some similarities between them that's responsible for them being under the same label. I'll address this quickly without going into too much detail because I don't think that it's that relevant to us artists. This is a, a diagram of a synovial joint and you can see that there is a, an articular capsule joining the bones together and inside this between the bones is what is called synovial fluid. Think of this as a, a lubrication for the bones and it also acts as a, a shock absorber. Also the two bones that meet will have surfaces that are able to mate like a, a female end and a male end and both ends will be covered with cartilage which is also another means of shock absorption. So that's a, a good diagram to illustrate the similarities, now it's time to look at each type of synovial joint. Before we do that I'll just take a moment to highlight the joints on what I've drawn here. Let's begin by looking at the ball and socket joints. The ball and socket joint, also referred to as the spheroid joint, is a synovial joint in which the ball shaped surface of one bone fits into a socket on another bone. An example of this is the shoulder joint where the humerus that includes the ball like shape at one end connects to the socket of the scapula. This is what I'm drawing here in this sketchbook and I'm also going to draw another example of this joint which is where the leg meets the pelvis. We've yet to cover the bones of the leg still but the ball shaped end of the femur bone fits within the socket lower down on the pelvis. This type of joint has the most freedom of movement out of any of the other joints and because of this it's sometimes categorised as a multi-axial joint. Next we have a saddle joint. This is a, a type of synovial joint in which the surface of one bone is concaved and meets another bone where the surface is convexed. 
An example of this one would be where the clavicles meet the manubrium, also known as the sternoclavicular joint. Now, we are going to be looking at the shoulder girdle again soon and looking at how it moves, but it might be good to know that this saddle joint is said to be biaxial, allowing for two degrees of freedom, whereas the, the ball and socket joint a moment ago was triaxial, allowing articulation with three degrees of freedom. With that being said, we look at how each of these joints allow their respected bones to move in later videos. The next joint is condyloid joints and this is a type of synovial joint in where one bone that has an oval like head meets another bone that has an elliptical cavity. The oval shaped bone sits within this joint and allows for circular motion but it is still quite restricted. You know the, the type of movement that's made by the hand as this joint can be found in the wrist. You only have to move your hand to see its limitations when it comes to movement it's considered biaxial, allowing for two degrees of freedom. Now we have the hinge joints, and this is a type of synovial joint that resembles how a door hinge works, hence its name. It only allows motion with one degree of freedom, which is up and down, and so this is considered to be uniaxial. An example of this would be the elbow joint between the humerus and the ulna, where one surface of bone, in this case the humerus, prevents the ulna and radius moving back beyond a certain angle, meaning it only bends in the one direction. And this type of joint is also found in our fingers and toes. There is also a pivot joint and this type of synovial joint allows one bone to rotate around another. A good example of this would be the proximal and distal radio ulna joints where the radius rotates around the ulna. This joint is considered to be a, a uniaxial joint and here again I'm making some notes of this in the sketchbook. So those are the types of synovial joints that exist and as I said we'll be looking at each of them more in depth when we discuss how they allow various bones to move, which we'll start doing in the next video. So until then, this has been another study session, I hope you found it useful, if you did then please leave a like. Remember, I post a, a lot of study documents on Patreon as well that are all of what I cover here, nicely presented on paper. With that being said, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed the content I create, then do consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You will gain access to exclusive tutorials, study documents, process papers, real-time drawing footage and more. Plus, you will also be supporting me in a more personal way. Other than that, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you soon.